series last week that Joel took us on called My Purpose, Our Purpose. And uh, I'm going to speak this morning from uh, around the idea of lessons from the desert, not the dessert, <laughs> from the desert. And uh, there's some wonderful things and principles that we can learn from. And the idea of this mini series over the next few weeks, Joel and Josh will be carrying us, is to reorientate from scripture uh, who we are, whose we are, and where we're actually going. How many of you know that we can lose our way pretty quick? We can uh, <clears throat> fall into all sorts of potholes on the way and we can come unstuck in, in so many different ways and, and we can lose passion and lose purpose. And having purpose is a powerful force that leads us to our calling. And having an inkling and understanding why you and I are alive is just so precious. It's, it's a God-given privilege. It's a precious understanding. It's a divine responsibility. I'll throw this out. Imagine living this life without knowing your purpose. Right? I want to just pause and ask as we just get underway this morning, what's your purpose? What's your purpose? What, what's our purpose? God speak to us, it speaks to us individually and he speaks to us corporately, but what's, what's your purpose for being here at Gateway? <laughs> What's our purpose of being here established in Albert Park? They're the, the questions. And there's visitors coming in each week, and we want to catch the next wave of people. <clears throat> what's, what's your point for living? If you're taking notes, write down your point. Write down your point now, and then at the end of the series, write down that same question and see if it's changed a little bit as God speaks to us. And last week, Joel began to take us uh, through the narrative of the Hebrews coming up out of Egypt. And there they were in exile or in slavery for 400 years, crying out to God to be delivered. 400 years is a long time. That's generation after generation. And there they were crying out for someone to come and rescue them. And God, who hears uh, the cries and the pleas of his people, he raised up, as we know the story, raised up a deliverer called Moses. And Moses is a type of Christ, meaning that he's a shadow of Christ. Uh, he delivered the, Egypt, the, the Hebrews up out of Egypt, and Christ also delivers us. And I'll say this just to get underway. The story of Hebrews and uh, our story are somewhat similar. Their narrative is our narrative. Their identity is our identity. And we can take precious principles and promises from them. And in doing, that, in doing so, so we just get that right there. We'll uh, throw out something this week, the system, <laughs> throughout the system. <clears throat> in doing so, God told them who they were and he reminded them of their identity and identity is linked with purpose. And he basically comes and tells them that they are no longer slaves. love what Mary Ann said. She spoke about freedom. That's what Christ wants to do. I love how the words came down, worthy. You're worthy. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his mercy and grace and his love for us. And this is what God said about them, Exodus 19, 5 to 6. Now it says, if you fully obey me and keep my covenant, then... Out of all the nations, you'll be my treasured possessions on the screen. Although the whole earth is mine, you'll be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. He's basically saying, you're my treasured people, my holy people. This is who you are. My prized possession. A kingdom of priests. And it's interesting in 1 Peter, we know this. 1 Peter picks up this concept coming into the New Testament. 1 Peter 2.9, it says this, talking about believers, talking about us, but you are a chosen people. Let me just work through that for a moment. It's one thing to be accepted by God. It's one thing to be known by God, but to be chosen by God is a beautiful thing. Many are called, but few are chosen. A royal priesthood, only priests 
and royalty can minister to royalty, can get into the same space of royalty. A holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful, what is it, wonderful light. Wonderful light. I want to propose to you, I want to set this up. God told them and he tells us who we are. You're no longer a slave. He tells us who we are. You are God's holy people, royal priesthood, chosen nation. And there's a point to it. There is a purpose to it. The purpose is, we just read it, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. But there's something in the middle as well that I want to explore this morning. Really important that we come through the process of being able to declare the praises of him who called us. Now, the way we declare God's praises comes from 1 Peter. Just a few points. What does declaring God's praises actually mean? 1 Peter 2.12 on the screen gives us a clue. Believers are to live such good lives that their pagan neighbors would end up giving glory to God, living a life of holiness and righteousness. God chose us before time began to be holy and blameless in his sight. By urging wives, it speaks to the wives to win their unbelieving husbands to faith through godly conduct. It's how we declare God's praises. He calls on us to give an answer to everyone who asks. It includes, as I said, living holy lives. It includes discipleship. It includes getting on with making God's name famous. <laughs> and so God tells us, you're a chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, and he tells us to declare the praise of him who called But I want to I focus in on this space this morning, and we're going to get lessons from the desert to help us live out our purpose. Does that make sense? We're good with the start. We understand the end, but we get a little bit lost in the middle. And if we get the middle right, it's going to help us fulfill our purpose. Is that all right? Jesus speaks to us in that he knew his purpose, and he knew his purpose because he knew who he belonged to. He was the Son of God. Remember, he was found at the age of 12 in the temple, and he turns around after his parents had left, and he says, hey, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? Jesus' identity and purpose were linked, and, and your identity and purpose is linked. And, but Jesus grew in stature and wisdom, and we found favor with man and God, and there was a process for him to live out his calling. So the point is this, what is the point of being redeemed? Many of us have been saved this morning by the precious blood of Jesus, the only way you can be saved. What is the point of being saved and set free from bondage out of darkness? What is the point? What is our purpose? What is our purpose? I want to say this. We've just read that it's to declare the praise of him who called us, but in the middle right here, before we get to declaring the praise of him who called us, it is to come to know God personally and intimately. God doesn't save us first and foremost just to use us, does he? God redeemed us and saved us so that he can know us. And out of knowing us comes us declaring who God is. That's the purpose of creation, isn't it? That's what Adam and Eve illustrate to us, that there they were in the cool of the, of the garden, in the cool of the night. They would just look up and speak to God, and God would speak to them in perfect relationship and intimacy. That's the point, isn't it, of creation? Before they had to work the garden, before they had to work the animals, it was coming to know God. This is the middle section. The Westminster Catechism says, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. <clears throat> but in order to live out a purpose, we must know him. Hold on, there's, there's something coming this morning. We must know him. The Hebrews' time in the desert gives us fundamental principles you see, here's the deal. There are too many people trying to live out our purpose without knowing God first. And we heard last week that when that happens, it turns to custard. Because you know what they did? They made a golden calf in the desert. And people died. 
Because why? Because they didn't know their God intimately first. This message is really about knowing God intimately. And I just feel at Gateway, we just need to get back to the good old-fashioned way of just knowing the Lord, what He says and what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. That's my heart before I go for a couple of weeks away. With all the avenues and pathways and confusion and fear, I would just love as a church if we just got back to understanding and knowing and hearing God's voice and following His leading. And God, he was bringing his people up out of Egypt. And we read about it. He was actually bringing them up out of Egypt beyond them just being set free. He was bringing them up out of Egypt. Hold on to this verse. Exodus 19, verse 3. Then Moses went up to God and the Lord called him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you where? To myself. Who would have thought that you can find God in the desert? And God was bringing his people first and foremost, oh, yes, out of slavery, praise Jesus, but he was bringing his people to himself. Hold on to that. So that they would know him, love him, respect him, obey him, fear him. You see, God had great plans and great purposes for the Hebrew people coming up out of Egypt. It was to the promised land. We know it. But God was saying, before you get to the promised land, I want you to come through the desert and learn from me and know me before you get there. And the reason is, is because if we don't come through the desert, we're going to turn that place, you've heard it said before, we're going to turn that place of blessing, oh, blessing, we're going to turn that place of blessing into idolatry. And I'll get to it, I'll get to it, I'll let it be out now. No, we're loving the things of this world more than Jesus. Is that not what we've done in the Western world? And God is saying, no, 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 I've got great plans and purposes but unless you come through and understand my heart first, you're going to miss the boat and you're going to miss your purpose. You're right? <laughs> he started a process. And we've heard it said that even though they've come up out of Egypt, he wanted to get the Egypt out of them. And Joel spoke into that last week. 2 Corinthians 6.17, it says, Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing. And what will happen if you touch no unclean thing and separate ourselves from the worldliness? What will happen? God will receive us. Isn't this interesting? <laughs> Isn't this interesting how we've made Christianity where we say a little prayer to Jesus, say a little prayer to Jesus, she'll be right, I'm good with you, and live my own way. And God is saying, no, 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 no. You actually come out and live in holiness and separation, and then I'm going to come and come close to you, and you can come close to me, and I'll receive you. And so God carried them on eagles' wings. <clears throat> There's three points I just want to quickly give you before we get into our meeting and lunch, if you're hanging around. Number one, God wanted to bring his people into a new way of thinking. He wanted to give them a new constitution. He wanted to bring them a new constitution. <clears throat> God had to come and rewire his people because they had been living in slavery for 400 years under a tyrant called Pharaoh. And God had to bring them out and say, hey, you know how you're going to relate to me now? I'm going to give you a new way of thinking. I'm going to give you a new constitution. Galatians 5.13 says, as well, it says, you, my brothers, were called to be free. You were called to be free. I'm called to be free. What's our purpose? To live in freedom. But our freedom will only come when we're under the constitution of King Jesus rather than the constitution of Pharaoh. And Moses was invited to the mountain. <laughs> Exodus 19, the Lord said to Moses, go and tell the people to consecrate themselves today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Uh, and on that, go and read it. Exodus 19, God came 
and his presence came and there was fire and smoke and rumbling and they had to clean themselves up physically. They had to prepare themselves because God was coming to meet his people to give them a new way of doing it. And the next chapter is all about the Ten Commandments where God gave ten major commandments, 613 laws about how you to look after people, how you relate to God, how to relate to other people, how to be safe, how to be clean, how to have hygiene. <coughs> 613 laws were given and God says, this is how you're to understand my moral perfection and this is how you're to understand who I am. That was new for the people, these desert people. And likewise with us, we need to learn the new constitution before we can walk into our purpose. The constitution is no longer, praise God, you've heard it said, the constitution is not 613 laws that we have to abide by, praise Jesus. It's summed up in two, love God and love people. <laughs> and the beauty thing about it is that some of us are trying to live out our purpose by being under the old covenant and under the old law and trying to please God by don't do this, do that, do that, like rules everywhere. And God is saying, you know what? Now I'm going to give you a new constitution and the constitution doesn't come from the outward. The constitution now comes from the inward. And I'm going to write them on your heart. And you're just going to want to have this desire to please me. And let me just say this. When you and I are trying to live out our purpose to declare the praises of God, it's far better than living under the new constitution where the constitution is written on your heart than the old constitution. Because you'll be dead as a bad, sad sack of rocks if you're under the old covenant. That's what I'm trying to teach them. That's what God's trying to teach us this morning as we live out our purpose to make his name great. <laughs> Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel speaks into it. Isaiah speaks into it, the suffering servant. Jeremiah 31 on the screen, 33 to 35, it says, this is the covenant I'll make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I'll put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest. Here's the deal. How can we declare the praises of God? How can we declare the praise of anyone that we don't know? Oh, how, how can we say anything or speak of anything about something that we know nothing of? And God is saying, if you want to live out your purpose, you're going to have to come through and know me. And beautiful thing is, when we get under the new covenant, under grace, God actually teaches, and you don't need your neighbor to tell you anything about God. That's not in arrogance. It's not that we don't come to church and learn and connect groups and all these things, but God will write his heart, his law on our hearts. That's good stuff. If you want to live out your God-given purpose, get into the New Testament, get into the new covenant, the new agreement. All of a sudden you go, man, I can't help but talk about the praise of God. Won't, they, won't, they, won't that cut out all the dreariness? <laughs> All the, oh, I think I'm available. I'm not sure if I'm available. Like, like, all the pettiness that goes on. Like, you know, God, He's good. His mercy abounds forever. I am there, baby. Talking about Jesus. Mm, hold your fire. <laughs> the second point is, I'll move through this a bit quicker, is a new way of doing obedience to God. Knowing His ways, knowing His heart, knowing that He's good knowing that he's merciful. <laughs> God put his people through the test. Check this out. Deuteronomy 8, 2 to 6, it says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. What's the purpose? To humble you? To test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Commands, keeping his commands is synonymous with loving Jesus. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. It's funny how we separate. Oh, you're legalistic. No, no, no. I just love Jesus. He humbled you. This is how God humbled them. He humbled them by causing them to hunger. God caused them to hunger. And then feeding you with manna, which neither you, knew, you knew, nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of of God, go to Exodus 16 there, Lockie. 
This is what happened. They were grumbling, and God says, I'm going to give you manna from heaven. And God said to them, each day I want you to collect the manna that you need for the day. Some collected lots, some collected a small amount. And God says, you to go out every day because I'm going to provide for you every day. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God every day. And he said on the sixth day, don't collect more than what you need because if you collect it more for what you need to the next day, it's going to get rotten and disgusting. But on the sixth day, I want you to collect more than what you need because the Sabbath's kicking in on the seventh day. And lo and behold, they woke up and the manna was not disgusting or rotten because God gave them commandments for them to follow. Find the verse for me, <laughs> Lockie, there. Verse 20, maybe. Get this. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until the morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was very angry with them. They, they thought they could just go against what God had said, simply trusting in his provision. And they had to walk humbly because mm, it was God who was feeding them. Can't get too arrogant or proud knowing that mm, it's God. And then check this out. You think they would have learned the lesson. Go down to verse 27, Lockie, for me. <laughs> On the sixth day, they were instructed to get more for the seventh day because the seventh day was meant to be a day of rest. But nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, that was the Hebrews right through the desert. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to try and gather it, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? God was saying, I'm trying to teach you stuff here, man. And you're not getting it. And I'm trying to move you into my purpose. But if you don't get my heart here, how are you going to get my heart there? If you can't obey here, you're not going to obey there. And church, can I just say, just a bit of application. We're trying to, we're trying to live out here. And we're just turning God's name into whatever we think, whatever we need, whatever. And, and we've, 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 we're not coming through the process of knowing what it means to obey the Lord. And there's grave dangers, as we said, the golden calf. The earth swallowed people. Go and read Exodus. Terrible. People got struck down dead. They got into the promised land and they had to stone the people because they disobeyed God. Go and read it. Fascinating stuff. <laughs> and so... God was humbling them, teaching them. Why? Because he wanted to bless them. He wanted to bless them. Final point. This is, this is the main point. You can wait to get there. <laughs> the third point of the desert is this. The principle that we can learn of is that it's a new way of knowing and knowing his presence. They were used to following Pharaoh back in slavery. Now they were learning to follow God, his leading and his presence. I want to say something here about God's presence. If you're taking notes, try and have a go at it. What, how would you describe or articulate what God's presence is? Josh already proclaimed that God is here. Some of us will walk out and go, yeah, I was in the presence of God this morning. Some of you walk out and go, I felt nothing. Here's my definition of what his presence is on the screen. It's being in pro close proximity to God and knowing it. Where we experience him and know him and feel him. <laughs> and the Hebrews knew God's presence. They were led by God's presence. Exodus 13, 21, it says, By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night, neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. <coughs> they were learning to be led by God's presence. Hold on to this. By God's presence. Exodus 33, check out Moses. This is the tent of meeting. Moses would go and meet with God and meet in a tent pitched outside the camp calling at the tent of meeting, he would go inquire of the Lord. 
Verse 8, and whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to the tents, watching Moses until he, until he entered the tent. Verse 9, as Moses went to the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord was with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped each at the entrance of their tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young age, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. <laughs> no wonder, church, that Moses didn't want to leave the desert before the promised land without God's presence. Because it was in his presence that he was able to speak face to face with God. He says to the response of the Lord, verse 15, Moses said, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Check this out. You want to proclaim his, people, proclaim his name, declare his praises? You know what the number one thing that's going to allow us to live out our purpose is to have his presence on our lives. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? Keep going there, Lockie. <laughs> what else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people in the face of the earth if it's not your presence? How else are we going to be a blessing to those who aren't blessed yet without your presence? Well, I said, oh, I'll do the very thing you've asked because I'm pleased with you and I know you by name. He was tapping in to Jesus. <laughs> you know what? I'm not sure if God's so pleased with us by ourselves, but because of Jesus, who's our advocate, who's praying for us, God says, well, I'm pretty pleased with my son, Jesus. And as long as I'm pleased with Jesus, I'm pleased with you, Jeremy. Because Moses is a type of Christ. <laughs> Talking about his presence. Everything we need is found in the presence of God. Some words here. Satisfaction. Provision. Healing. Wholeness. It all comes from his presence. Psalm 1611, the psalmist David got a little bit of excited. And he says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. <laughs> I was at the footy yesterday. Oh, the pleasures of a goal. Oh, yeah. Seen him line up to get in the footy. I'm going to have a little bit of a go here. Have we ever tasted the joy of the Lord that emanates from his presence? Have, 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 have we ever tasted the joy of the Lord that emanates from his presence? How blessed you are. <laughs> there is a place where we can enjoy God's presence. All of a sudden, the things grow dim on this world, on this earth. Psalm 84.10, check this out. There is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Just by being with the Lord in prayer, can I ask? Can I ask before I go away? Do you enjoy prayer? I wouldn't have known because we only get 20 at the prayer meetings. Do you spend time in prayer enjoying God? I'll say this, the number one reason why we don't hear the voice of the Lord in his presence is because we don't really want to know the voice of the Lord. Because we would prefer to be in a place where we love the things of this world more than Jesus. That's true, isn't it? That's true. Is that true? Add busyness to that and distractions to that. How on earth do we hear God's voice and enjoy him? When we're so caught up. Come on, let's, let's, we need some honesty here this morning. <laughs> we, we love to talk more about God and processes in the church rather than God himself in so many ways. 
Is this all right? Come on. Well, purpose, first and foremost, is to commune with God. And we're meant to enjoy it. But the things of this world, God says, the love of this world, if you love the world, the things in it, it's enmity towards me. That's our purpose. <laughs> Get this verse out, Romans 14, 17. It says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Hold that there. I want to lean on that for a bit. You would think, based on our social media, you would think of all the talk, you would think of all the stuff, that our pleasures and our kicks come from what we eat and drink and have physically in our lives today. You would think that. So the kingdom of God is not about these things. It's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Can I ask you, do you have joy in the Holy Spirit? That's our purpose. That's why we're born to be in His kingdom, to have joy and pleasure and peace. <laughs> Let me read this out. In so many ways, I fear we have turned Christianity into formal ceremonial processes driven by time, agendas, and ways of behaving and functioning and relating to each other, which can often be sterile. I'll read it again. I fear we have turned Christianity into formal ceremonial processes driven by time, agendas, and ways of behaving and functioning and relating to each other, which can be often sterile. And the danger is that we don't actually enjoy his presence and the life-giving sap that nourishes our souls. <laughs> you know, when we talk about stuff, we talk about the church. We've said it. We talk about what should happen, what shouldn't happen. We talk about mm, 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 mm. When's the last time you said, I just, I just, <laughs> I've got a revelation of his mercy this morning, of his grace this morning. I woke up and the Lord revealed something about his heart to me this morning for this world. Ah, no, that ain't right. That's not good. I'm going, praise God that God is good. If we're going to walk into our purpose of declaring his praises with any vigor, with any passion, with any Holy Ghost fire, we're going to need to get a little bit radical in how we connect with Jesus. Uh, it's gonna, something's going to have to happen. <laughs> something's going to have to happen. Maybe a three-week fast. Something's, um, <clears throat> I'm reading books this week where churches went on 40-day fasts to break through and to get God's attention. The revivals that they prayed, they would literally be staying in their own puddles because of the hunger for God. You might have to turn the box off for 12 months to get God's word into us. If you want to hear his voice, if you want to enjoy his presence, God will not share his presence while we're watching junk on TV. It's true. Preaching to myself, Jeremy. Want the revelation and wisdom from heaven? Well, getting in the junk? It says God Almighty. Who's up for a three-week fast? Oh, can't give up a meal. If anyone's pregnant or dietary comes, don't give up those meals. No, I'm serious. I love it. <coughs> when the early church, 120 of them, they met in the upper room. <coughs> and what were they doing? Praising and worshipping. And what happened? The Holy Spirit was poured out. And they received power. Tongues of fire came. You receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And power they went out with. And the world was turned upside down because they had power from on high. Oh, there were issues. Yeah, people got struck down dead. There were issues, big issues. But they were living out their purpose because they knew Jesus. So let me ask you, what are we doing here? <laughs> A gateway? What are you doing here at Gateway? What's your purpose here at Gateway? I love it. 3,000 people got saved. 
which is in direct contrary comparison to the 3,000 people in the Old Testament who died. (laughs) Why did 3,000 people get saved? Because they went to the mountain to get with God and the Spirit of Jesus came and brought life. Whereas back here, they didn't go to the mountain. What happened? They died. They were waiting in one accord, praying together, arms lifted up, kissing each other, brotherly love, just waiting on the Holy Spirit until you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Oh, flip, I've gone over time. Let's cut the meeting. So I'm being, I need a holiday. <laughs> You know, when, when the Holy Spirit pours out on us, all the, I've got the three L's, all the lethargy, the laziness and the lax, lukewarm attitudes towards God gets burnt off and burnt out, it gets burnt out. God didn't save us to use us. First and foremost, he saved us to know us. But you can't be used of God if you don't know God. Knowing the Lord intimately under the new covenant in obedience and the love of his presence. Matthew 7 on the screen, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, didn't we go out and do stuff? Didn't we go out and be, we're used of you, do all that? And God says, no, 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 I didn't know you. You've missed an important step. I didn't know you. Church, get radical. I know it's cold. I know it's wet. Just get radical for Jesus. Something has to shift if you want to get caught up in the glory of God to fulfill your purpose. We love that you come. But don't come without knowing the Lord. It's knowing the Lord, isn't it? It's knowing the Lord. It's a presence. I can live without stained glass windows or bad coffee or whatever we have. No, no, I don't drink coffee. Sorry, brother. I don't drink coffee. That was just preachers talk. (laughs) But I can't live without his presence. And nor can you. Nor can you. I'm going to ask, if you don't know the Lord this morning, you're going to get you to do something really brave, just as musos come and eyes closed, heads bound. (laughs) If you don't know the Lord this morning, just as uh, no one's looking around, (laughs) if you don't know the Lord personally or intimately this morning, you'd like to be redeemed by his blood, get saved, set free, get to know him. Eyes closed, heads head bowed, please, just for the sake of someone who might get saved this morning. You just raise your hand. Is there anyone who doesn't know the Lord intimately and wants to know the Lord intimately? Yeah, praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Two, a couple of people. <laughs> anyone else? Praise God. Let me pray. Heavenly Father. <laughs> Father, we don't want to make this just a religious experience and we don't want to miss your heart. We want to live out our purpose to make your name famous, to carry on your work, to make disciples of all nations. But Father, we acknowledge and recognize that we can't do that without knowing you personally. Lord, drop something into our spirit. Lord, we ask even to, 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 we give you permission to pick us up by the collar and drag us through to a place where we come to know you. And Father, we dare to pray, get us to a point where we say, even if it's the desert experience, take us through. We, we, we do want to know you. Teach us your heart, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, that is all from us. We hope you enjoyed that sermon today. We just want to encourage you, if you can jump on our YouTube channel right now, click on the subscribe button or on the like button. That will give you all the latest content. Why don't you also share that message with somebody today? We can't wait to see you next week. Don't forget, 10 a.m. See you then.